my name is Joel Richards. You know, as I was saying, I have a whole ministry where I give pastors rest. Um, I go around Boston and Massachusetts and just try to, I get a chance to unpack scripture with um, different congregations. If I get a little choked up, I just, I, it's easier if I say it. My mother passed six months ago. Um, and I know, see, I was getting over there just before I came up. Um, I would not be a Christian if it wasn't for her and my father's prayers. I got, I'm a late convert at 27. Um, and then I know for a fact she always wanted me to be a preacher. I said, never, never. When God's will and your mother's prayers come together, just give up. Just, just do what they say. <laughs> and so for years of fighting it, I, I joined, we joined uh, CRC. Our church merged with them. And um, they had a leadership course. And I thought I was just going to be an elder and get to tell the pastors what to do for once. You know, all the things you're doing wrong, finally. You know, and no, they were like, you need to, <laughs> we actually want you to start a ministry. And a preaching ministry was born. And the great part is literally, you know, because live streaming wasn't a big thing in the churches I would, my mother finally got to see me preach live maybe a month before she passed. Um, and at her funeral, I preached her favorite verse, the 91st Psalm, so in her honor. So. If I get choked up, it's because of that. There's nothing else. Uh, the word is overwhelming. I get choked up reading the Bible all the time. But it's just because I just get to reflect and just see her and miss her when I get up here. So it's easier if I talk about it. I tried to hold it back one time, and then I was just frogging the whole time and getting choked up. But it's just, it feels so much better when I let it out as a testimony to what prayer does. So if you're a parent, pray for your kids. If you're a Christian, pray for everyone that they find Jesus because I'm a testament to that. Amen? So I'm excited to be here today because the word of God is powerful. And when he, I'll just say this, I'll give this to you for free. Um, if you just want a chance to commune with the Holy Spirit, just take a minute and read your word. I was actually talking to a, uh, a person that I've been discipling. He was like, oh, I put priorities. I'm gonna read the Bible twice a week. I was like, bro, that's trash. <laughs> read a scripture every day, twice a week, no. He's like, that's so hard. And literally the other day we were talking, he was like, oh, I started doing that and it is, it's just easy. You read a chapter and he's just like, and it just feels good. And there's a lot of unpacking and you just get to be alone with the word of God just for five to 10 minutes a day. And so the great part is when someone asked me, to preach on a certain scripture or passage, I just get to just read that over and over and explore and be a nerd and do word studies and do all types of stuff and just let the Holy Spirit expose so much about myself and society when I get to read the word of God. So I've already prayed, so let's just jump right in. I always like to give an overview um, of, the, uh, of where I'm going when I preach. It's the teacher in me, I guess. Um, so where are we going? The scripture, you need to just hear this whole story. Usually I like to just use my teacher voice and read this one to you, but so much is happening and there's a lot of specific words. So I would actually, if you could just turn to Obadiah as I'm going over my overview. So when I start reading, you're there with me, right? Uh, who are the Edomites, right? And um, the unique nature of this short story, it's very short, but there is a lot in there, right? That we can unpack. And um, cultural lies and the greed that that breeds and then what to pray for. I always like to leave you with something just to add into your pray li prayer life, something actionable to do. So real quick, God used prophets to share his vision and purpose with the people of God. Prophets would have been well known and obvious to the people around them, right? Amen. People being filled with the spirit, living for God, speaking on his behalf would have been very well known to the people around him. I hope that challenges us in our lives because we're filled with the spirit. I hope people are well known who we work for and who we serve right? We call Obadiah a minor prophet, but I, in no way was he probably a minor person in the community he lived in, right? Um, he, and when we talk about like prophecy and what a prophet is, remember like even Eli, who was raising Samuel, because some people consider you're Samuel the first prophet, but it was said a man of God visited Eli to tell him his house was going to fall, right? That would have just been the saint. What's the difference between being called that and a prophet, right? Even it said Saul prophesied. We never read his prophecies, but he was filled with the spirit. So he was working and speaking on behalf of God. So we might call him a minor prophet because it's not very long, but his point is very poignant. And I guarantee you, the people around him knew who he served, amen? So let's, you guys, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> you have to participate, call and response, amen, agree. This is a thing, if you're at home, type it in the chat. Come on, I got to know that you're awake and with, that's a teacher in me. Come on, when I say it, I make my students say amen. So you guys can do it too, all right? <laughs> so, right? So let us read the vision God gave Obadiah. 
Edom will be humbled. Thus says the Lord concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord. A messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling. Who say in your heart, who will bring me down on the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if plunders came by night, how you have been destroyed? Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How, Asua, have, has been pillaged? His treasure sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have, de have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on the day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Asua? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Asua will be cut off by slaughter. Edom's violence against Jacob. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloft, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates, and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. The day of the Lord is near, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink on my holy mountain. I'm sorry, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow, and shall be as though they have never been. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph's a flame, and the house of Asua stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivors for the house of Asua, for the Lord has spoken. The kingdom of the Lord. Those of the Negab shall possess Mount Asua, and those of the Sheplah shall possess the land of the Philistines, and they shall possess the land of Ephraim, and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of the host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Ephrath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sephard shall possess the cities of Negeb. Savior shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Asua, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Amen. That is the word. That is a deep story and a very intricate plan, right? But a lot there is to unpack, right? I try to think of which ways to go, but I want to relate it to us today in the, in the church because this is actually speaking directly to us as a congregation, as a small C and as the big C, right? First, who are the Edomites? The Edomites keep popping up throughout the Old Testament scripture. The Edomites are the people descended from Asua who we all know was the hairy, skillful hunter. I thought that would bring up all the things. <laughs> who sold his birthright for soup, right? <laughs> and then, in, but even originating from those kind of people, they still had a lot of pride to them, right? Um, the uh, Asua was nicknamed Edom, which means red, probably because he had red hair. Asua eventually settled in the area of Mount Seir and absorbed a people known as the Hudites, which refers to Edomite rulers as dukes in the King James Version, right? 
When Israel came out of Egypt and wanted to pass through the land of the Edomites to enter into the promised land, the Edomites wouldn't let them. So these people keep popping up throughout the Old Testament, right? So let's talk about the unique nature of this specific story, Obadiah, right? Now that we understand who the Edomites are, we understand that where they originate from, we understand their kind of thought process as a people, right? So the Hebrew name Obadiah means worshiper of Yahweh or servant of Yahweh. There are actually 13 Obadiahs in the Old Testament, and one of these may be the Obadiah who wrote this book. This, so Obadiah, meaning worshiper, right? But the Obadiahs we keep seeing aren't just in church singing, aren't just doing these things. They get this name because they're actually out doing God's work. Uh, and Obadiah was an officer in King Ahab of Israel's court, and, his, and he was God's prophet. He actually hid some of the prophets and protected 150 of them for being slaughtered, right? Out there doing the Lord's work, protecting people from harm, right? And Obadiah was uh, sent out to teach the law, right, to the people of Judah. And this brought peace and prosperity throughout that whole region, right? Because they were actually teaching the word and bringing God's word and justice to, those, to that region. And then Obadiah was a priest in the days of Nehemiah. What makes this totally unique about that name Obadiah keep popping up? What makes this prophecy totally unique is that it doesn't deal with Judah or Israel. This prophecy actually is one of the few that actually don't specifically talk about Israel or Judah. It actually talks about Edom and the judgment coming upon them. The scripture literally says, thus says the Lord concerning Edom, right? If we think about the prophets that you've been going over, usually it's directly at Israel or Judah, right? So now we have a whole historical context. We understand who the Edomites are. We understand Obadiah. Now let's dive into what this scripture is trying to tell us now, all right? There are certain cultural lies that we tell ourselves to feel comfortable. There's certain things that we tell ourselves so that we can go on our daily lives, right? And I feel like when you really explore the Edomites, they give us a lot of insight to ourselves. They literally thought they were culturally superior to their own kin, to the people that they originated from, because they lived in a mountain that was hard to conquer, right? They didn't build this mountain, right? They, they didn't design it, right? Literally, God did. Instead of taking that protection and looking at how they could build or help others, they took it as a sense of self, right? They took credit for where they were born. They took credit for um, things that they had no control of. Does that sound like anyone today? Have you ever been victim of that in your own heart, in your own mind? I know I have done those things. Have you ever looked at someone who couldn't move something as fast as you are, do something as fast as you, have you ever looked at your superior to them, right? But even though you have no control, you didn't design your brain, you didn't design your body, right? The scripture literally says, though you exalt yourself as high as the eagle, that's actually kind of mocking them. I love to read the message translation sometimes because it's written in like how today's language, if you ever really want to feel corrected, you should read Proverbs in the, um, in the message. Solomon was a lot meaner than we thought. Like, he is really, <laughs> like, so I feel like if you go to the message translation on this, you thought you were so great, perched high among the rocks, king of the mountain, thinking to yourself, nobody can get to me. Nobody can touch me. Think again. Even if, like an eagle, you hang out on a high cliff, even if you build your nest in the stars, I'll bring you down to earth. God, sure world, right? Through this scripture, I really want you to pause and think. What truth of God is he trying to bring you down off your high horse or your high cliff? What truth in the Bible and the word is he talking to you inside your heart that you hold over people, right? Or that's caused you to be passive or inactive in certain, in certain parts of our world, right? right? Every time you want to test what you believe about yourself, say to yourself, did you invent that mountain, right? Just ask yourself that. Did you decide where your parents were? Did you decide the neighborhood you were going to grow up in? Right? Whatever you are done or think you, that you're going to do or that you created, think about this. When you go to sleep at night, you don't decide if you wake up. Right? Think about that. How can we think so highly of ourselves? Right? But there's actually a lot of freedom in this thought. As Christian, as believers, we have a lot of purpose because we know 
right? Amen, who wakes us up in the morning, right? We know who gave us this job. We know who gave us the intellect that we have, right? And now all those gifts and things and purposes and that we have, have a purpose, right? We thought it would be used to build our own stuff, right? We thought that maybe we live in a great neighborhood, right? Or we, um, we were born in, to go to great schools and to learn all types of facts, to build our own lives, to, to live in our own mountain cliffs, right? But what is it actually for? Why would God do that, right? If you think about it, there's a lot of pressure without God in our lives, right? If you were given a lot, what, is it, what do they always say, like even in Spider-Man, um, with great you know, power comes great responsibility or all that type of stuff, right? But in actuality, with a great God becomes great purpose, amen? Right? With a, we are freed from the pressures of that, right? We actually can just lean in and be like Obadiah and talk truth to power. Be courageous and talk truth to the things that are going wrong, right? If you have a great big house, you can house people, amen? You can, and so when, when we think about the Edomites and their loftiness and that God had to bring them down, right? But they sent, but the one thing that I will say that God did in this, you see he has a plan also at the end where he's going to bring his kingdom and establish something to help other people and bring other people that are actually worshiping him into that mountain place so that people can actually get helped with this protection that he actually gave, is that we can be like Obadiah. Obadiah is a challenge to all of us, right, to actually act, right? We can actually be worshipers of God with our actions, with the things that we do, with the things that we say, with the people that we help, right? So I want to talk to you real quick about something called idol worship, right? So a lot of times in our modern world, when we think of idol worship, we think that people in the ancient world were bowing to statues and actually believed these things. Not exactly, right? They knew Artemis wasn't a real god, but it was the ideology of what Artemis meant. It was the hierarchy that it set up in society. If I went to this school or if I did this thing, if I worshiped at this temple, I was of a higher status than someone else, right? Similar, does that sound like a society we live in today? Does that sound like a church we go to today? But so when it comes to idol worship, right, when it comes to idolatry, it's just a mindset. It's actually how you think and how you view the world, right? And so my wife, talking to her about this, said something very, very powerful. It's the crazy part about pride or privilege is that you pass it on to your kids, right? The Edomites didn't get here overnight. This was a belief in their society. Look at us in our mountain. We're better than those people down there. We're better than our own relatives down there, right? You would think if you met an Edomite, like, didn't your founder, then you're like, sell his birthright for soup? Get out of here. Like, just because you live in some mountain? <laughs> um, so, but you think about it, that is ignored because of the cultural lie that is being bred through their society that they're better than everyone. This is being passed down. So when we think about our own ideology, we also have to think about our modern church, right? So for years, people had corrupted, um, you know, like myth Greek mythology or Bilal or other gods to actually fit their ideology that fixed their society, to put them in a place of power. But we also have to admit that people have been doing that with Christianity for like a thousand years or from the day it was founded. They have been corrupting Christianity and bring it into their own ideology to fit the way they want society to be, right? A perfect example of that is the Crusades. If you ever want to see if, if culture is invading Christianity, it's always very convenient how it works out. You know, like one day the Pope is like, you know what? We need to go take back Jerusalem. You know, I know God said, you know, not on this mountain or that mountain, but we need Jerusalem and if you sin, you can actually be a better Christian if you go and fight people in a foreign land and take their land from them, which is the antithesis of the Bible. The Bible consistently talks about not taking land from people, not enslaving them and not robbing them and also being peaceful and bringing, whatever. <laughs> but like, have you seen that it's incredibly convenient, this belief that has been attached to Christianity? And that literally lasted for 400 years of trying to, of battling and trying to fight for Jerusalem instead of the resources of the church being used, hey, let's go over there and actually feed people. Let's go over there and actually preach the word. Let's go be like Obadiah and teach the law. Let's go over there and teach justice and peace and actually impact the world that way, right? Or when um, the Puritans first showed up here, conveniently, God had a contract with them over the Native Americans who were already here. Hey, God told us this is our land. 
Where? Like, what? I, would, I would like to see, is that written somewhere? Do you ever see the convenience in taking that, right? And people went with that. We all went to school and we heard manifest destiny, correct? Right? This is something that was believed, that these people were less than us because of our status, because they don't live like us, they don't wear shirt and ties, right? And then we could take their land, right? The convenience in a cultural lie is usually just based on greed. I was reading a book about, uh, from Tim Keller once, and this really impacted me, and it shows how our society is, um, that he said he's been a pastor for a long time, and has had a lot of people confess a lot of sins to him and work through. He said he has never heard one person ever say that they were greedy. He's never heard a person come in and say, I have to confess this, that I'm really, really greedy. Why? Because the cultural lies we believe, right? The more we have, right, it's better in our society, right? We could tell ourselves, oh, God is actually blessing us, right? God is actually blessing us to have more. So I don't have to think about anyone else. And if they have less, that's on their fault, right? A cultural lie that has been going through a lot of the church is this um, lie of, um, what is it, self cho- uh, self-choice, right? It's all about good choices that you make. That's how you get through life, right? And that has been, been spread, right? I won't, I won't say the person's name that's been spreading this ideology, but I even heard pastors preach and say this is a good thing that he's, that he's saying this to different people, waking up men, because if you just have good practical choices, you will, um, you will be good in life, right? But let's even talk on a deeper level of what you can't decide. We all know that redlining is real, right? That there were certain neighborhoods it, everywhere in this country where the government would draw a red line around and not invest in that neighborhood, right? So you know, despite where you were born, right, if the society around you decides not to invest in you, then how successful can you be, right? But if you live in the other part of that red line and society is investing in you, you will be more successful naturally, right? But then we tell ourselves this cultural lie, well, it's not my fault where I was born, right? It's not, I don't have any obligation to the people on the other side of the line, right? It's my goal in this modern society to just work hard and make as much money or buy the, the house and the car with no concern of anyone else on the other side. But the word of God says that's wrong, right? Literally says, I will knock you off your hill, right? The word of God through Obadiah is speaking to you and saying, those people on the other side of that red line are your responsibility, right? Those people on the other side of every situation that you're in is your responsibility. It goes deep, right? If you're at work, everyone who's a non-believer is your responsibility. You should be praying for them. You should be giving in life to them. You should have a space where people can come in and talk to you, right? You should have a ministry there, but you should also have a ministry outside of that, right? Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? All right. How are your conversations going? Are you taking credit for the success in your life? Or are you giving it all to God? All right. Are you humbling yourself? Because honestly, everything you have should make you once again question, what is God's plan for me? If I went to a great school, why did God send me here? Right. If I have a great job, why did God give me this? Right. Is it to find margins in my life where I can help other people? Or is it to tell other people that I'm culturally superior, that I'm better? Right. Let's get even a little messier. Who thinks of that about their own family? Oh, that person doesn't have what I have because they didn't do this or they didn't do that. Right? How do you think that messes with your heart if you have those cultural lies inside of you? If you're daily telling yourself that everything you have is just based off of your hard work or what you've done? Right? Sorry to harbor on this point. I'm probably just talking to myself, to be honest. <laughs> but I feel like Obadiah all those years ago was really just trying to tell us that, right? And I also have to think, I just want to point out something else. These prophets came before the destruction came. God is always very nice and very, uh, if you think about that, very merciful in that. If if a prophet came and told me this, what, repent, let me rip my clothes, ask God, if you ever go back to Jonah, they had the appropriate response. Jonah was like, hey, if you keep oppressing people, God's going to kill you. What? Okay, this makes sense, right? But a lot of people, when you see them, when a prophet comes and tells you, when you read the, it sounds like us, when the Bible tells you this, We ignore it. We're very comfortable in our cultural lives. We're very comfortable walking over people. If your heart isn't broken every day in this city, is the spirit alive in you? How many people do you see not in their right mind or homeless or struggling on this city today? 
when I would, my son would come to school with me and we would have to stop and pray every morning on Mass Ave because the amount of people out there suffering to chemical addiction. When we would drive around during COVID, you would just see the lines at bread lines out the door into the street. There are people starving in this city. There are people hungry in this city. There are people suffering under terrible conditions, right? And if you are, we're all prophets of the Lord. We're all filled with his spirit. We're judges. We're just like Obadiah, Samson. There is no difference between us and them. What are we doing about it? This is, I, I always have to say this is not a social justice gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? He came to serve, not be served, right? Anything that we are given is not for, if you think about it the way even everything says, right? A seed, um, the fruit that grows in us, right? Fruit and seeds edify everything around it, right? It grows in different areas, right? If you plant a seed somewhere, if you plant an apple seed in the right soil, it'll grow an apple tree and other people will be able to, uh, to feed from that and other people will be able to get apples from that. Animals will get um, shelter from that, right? We have that amazing ability, right, to plant ourselves wherever we are and other people can get fed, other people can get blessed, other people can get closer to Jesus through us. So I ask you, and I ask myself this, what are we doing about that? Would people call us Obadiahs? Would people say we are worshipers of Yahweh through our actions? Amen? We've got to participate. Amen? So I just want to say that Today, even in smaller things in the church, we have ministries that are telling people that if you're not reading the King James Version, you're not a real Christian, that uh, we pride ourselves on the success and the conditions of our neighborhoods, that we pride ourselves on the success of the rat race, right? We call it a rat race in, 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 in our capitalistic society, right? But the race you'll be judged on is the race that you run for God, amen? So... Let's move on. The next part I love to leave, uh, leave you with is what to pray for. And um, I kind of, God has been giving me this a lot as I like walk neighborhoods, as I interact with people. You have to ask yourself when you're praying, who is my neighbor? Right? Because God calls you to love your neighbor. But another cultural lie we tell ourselves is that we get to decide who our neighbor is. Right? That we get to say like, oh, this person has a similar educational background as me, I'm imitating myself, has a similar, um, you know, thought process as me, that's my neighbor. Is it? Because Jesus considered everyone his neighbor, and no one was smarter than him. No one had more access to money than him. So we have to ask ourselves, who is our neighbor? And why would God put this person in our path? Or am I, am I seeking out new neighbors? Am I looking across the city or across the town? Who is my neighbor who is suffering? right? Because the church is supposed to be a hospital for those that are sick, right? Uh, a, a place for those that are broken, right? Does, does, is my background or are my neighbors not look exactly or act exactly like me? Do I need conformity for someone to be considered my neighbor? Right? Cause that's a cultural lie we tell ourselves also there, right? Because we have to also say that passivity is a sin, just sitting idly by as everything is going on, the Bible consistently talks about from the parable about the seed to everything, to just sitting there and watching other people just suffer and just watching other people in our society go worse and worse is a sin. And you also have to ask, do you have a heart that Christ created if you don't feel bad about it? When you see things daily on TV, daily everywhere, right, are you affected by it? I don't watch the news. I don't need to cry. I cry. I can cry on my own, right? I don't need to hear about that, right? But this is a challenge. Obadiah is challenging us to do something, to get off our lofty hills, right? If we live in the richest country that has ever existed, are we forming that society to make sure that there's no more people that live on the street? Are we advocates so that everyone has access to medical care or everyone has access to the things that the mental health care that they need, right? Honestly, think about it. Should we live in a society where people walk around without having access to um, counselors and psychologists? Right? Think about just like down to that level, right? So I, the way you make sure that you see everyone as your neighbor, the way you make sure that you're not passive 
is with the most important thing the Bible tells us, love. Uh, Proverbs 3 tells us, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on a tablet of your heart, and you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. There's a reason. The, the Bible never, this, this impacted me. A pastor at CRNC told me the Bible never puts anything in there that just isn't important. But also, if he puts it in there, it's because it's nonsensical to us, our natural human ways. To wrap love around you, to do everything in love. If your heart is full of love, it affects your eyes. When you see someone suffering, you see your neighbor because you love them. Right? If we have the same eyes as Jesus had, the same heart, the same power in us, he died because he loved us. He died for that person's suffering. He died for us in the midst of it all, right? In the midst of our hard-heartedness and our, and our living on our false mountains thinking that we're great, he still died for us, right? And if love is wrapped around your neck, if love is living inside of you, everyone is your neighbor. When you see people walking long distances to get to work because there's no transit in their um, in their, uh, in their area, it hurts your heart. If you see a mother or someone struggling to, to buy food at the grocery store and they're like, oh, can I use this card, this card? If it doesn't hurt your heart, if it doesn't make you grab your card, is love wrapped around your neck? When you see the food lines long out the doors and it's not affecting you, right? As a teacher, I, our, I see things like, I've seen kids develop asthma because of the poor conditions of our buildings. Does that not hurt you? So I ask you to, to just pray that love is wrapped around your neck and that God reforms your eyes to see everyone as your neighbor so that you're no longer passive. Any parent could tell you if your child is hurt, you literally have to force yourself not to overreact so they don't cry. Amen? Who has seen that before? You're like, okay, they'll cry if I overreact, but it's hard. Why? Why? Because you love them. Right? I can see my son fall. I know he's not hurt. He's looking at my face. I have to be like, okay, I'm not going to react. You're good. You're okay. But it's hard because he knows the love I have for him, right? And isn't that the same way we should see this world? Isn't that the same way we should see Boston or anywhere we are, right? So I leave that all to say that I always like to leave this way. The world may call you a minor prophet, right? We call Obadiah a minor prophet. But when you meet your father, your savior, your God, if you live a life based on love and you see everyone as your neighbor, you will be very frustrated and tired, but he will call you good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Lord, you are a merciful and loving God. Please, Lord, come into our minds and heart and fill us with love. You have no need for us, but have so much love for us. Take our eyes, our wallets, our talents, our intellect, and use them all for your glory and purpose so that we may help those in need. And when we meet you, you will literally read to us Matthew 25, 40. What you did for the least of these, you did for me. Let all cultural lies be broken in our minds and let us not boast and let us fall let us fall on our knees broken by the weight of your sacrifice. Lord, you are good and we love you. Amen. That's all I got. This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston and our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com.